How do you separate justice and revenge when it comes to serial killers? In prison, there are inmates who ignore the difference, going so far as to send some of these nefarious monsters to an early grave. According to the New York Times, many co-workers of the hospital orderly Donald Harvey noticed that patients were dying while under his care. Because many were elderly or incredibly ill, those who knew him just joked about how he must have had bad vibes. But by the time Harvey was convicted in 1987, it wasn't so funny. He confessed to 37 murders, although he estimated he had killed around 70. Harvey is what we call an organized killer. He carefully planned his murders in order to avoid detection. Some of his victims were suffocated, some were neglected, and others were killed with a lethal dose of various poisons. But it was the poisoning that finally got him caught. An autopsy confirmed that a patient who died after being in a motorcycle accident was found to have suspicious levels of cyanide in the system. Harvey later explained, I felt what I was doing was right. I was putting people out of their misery. I hope if I'm ever sick and full of tubes or on a respirator, someone will come and end it. Someone did, in fact, put an early end to Harvey's life. In 2019, fellow inmate James Elliott was indicted for Harvey's 2017 murder. The two inmates were being held together in protective custody when Elliott severely beat Harvey in a cell, leading to Harvey's death. Elliott would later claim that he likely had a distant connection to at least one of Harvey's Maramont Hospital victims due to growing up near London, Kentucky. Leslie Bailey was a member of a gang of pedophiles responsible for recruiting or kidnapping at-risk underage boys into a prostitution ring that was active in England during the 1970s and 1980s. Bailey was convicted in 1989 of killing 14-year-old Jason Swift and was given a life sentence in 1991 for the murder of 6-year-old Barry Lewis. It wasn't until 1992 that he pleaded guilty to the 1984 murder of 7-year-old Mark Tildesley and was given the final of his three life sentences. According to The Guardian, law enforcement said that it's unclear just how many boys were killed by the gang, with reported estimates ranging from a vague several to 20. In 1993, law enforcement confirmed that Bailey had been found in his cell in Whitemore Prison, suspected initially to have died by suicide. However, the medical examiner later confirmed that he had been murdered. After an investigation, two other inmates, John Brooks and Michael Payne, were tried and convicted of the killing, which was reportedly done as revenge for Bailey's child victims. In 1967, after Albert DeSalvo's arrest for a slew of offenses, which included burglary and sexual assault, his defense attorney got him into the courtroom, getting around the initial ruling finding DeSalvo mentally unable to stand trial. It was during this trial that one of the psychiatrists who had examined DeSalvo testified, DeSalvo told me he was the strangler. He told me he strangled 13 women, and he went into the details of some of them, telling me some of the most intimate acts he committed. He confessed to those crimes because he thought he could get something out of it. A book deal, a movie deal, he could get better treatment in the prison system, something. The Boston Strangler stalked the city for two years, beginning in 1962. According to history, his reign of terror came to an end when one of DeSalvo's victims made it to the police and gave a description that led to his arrest. While DeSalvo was convicted and given a life sentence for his crimes, he was stabbed and killed on November 25, 1973, while at the Walpole State Prison. But that still wasn't the end of the story. A full 50 years later, ABC News reported advances in DNA technology had allowed Boston law enforcement to connect DeSalvo with the only DNA sample from the Boston Strangler left behind. It was taken from his final victim, 19-year-old Mary Sullivan, and when it was compared to DNA taken from DeSalvo's nephew, the positive match allowed for them to say for certain that yes, DeSalvo's confession had been legitimate. The Spanish-language news outlet El País interviewed Daniel Camargo Barbosa in 1988, when the courts were getting ready to hand down their sentence. While the then 58-year-old had confessed to the rape and murder of 71 women over an alleged two-year period in Ecuador, El País would also report that this represented only a small portion of his victims and a fraction of the time he had been killing. In his native Colombia, he was associated with a similar series of crimes, with around 80 possible victims. His first Ecuadorian victim disappeared on December 18, 1984, when she was just nine years old. His horrifying actions would continue, and when Barbosa was arrested in February of 1986, he was carrying the bloody clothes of his final victim, an eight-year-old girl. But perhaps even more shockingly, the longest prison term Ecuador would allow for his crimes was just 16 years. While he was given the full 16-year sentence, he served only six years of it. In spite of being under constant surveillance, he was killed by another inmate at the Guayuquil jail on November 13, 1994. By the time Donald Leroy Evans was brought to justice, the New York Times claims that his killing spree had spread across 20 states for over 10 years, which claimed more than 60 lives. This was in spite of the fact that he had been originally arrested on charges unrelated to murder, underwent a psychiatric evaluation, and was found to be a substantial risk to the public. I'm a serial killer. 
When he was finally arrested in connection with the murder of a 10-year-old girl, authorities say he got upset, claiming it was the first time he'd killed a child, and started sharing details of his other murders to prove that this was the case. At the time of his 1991 arrest, it was starting to look like his confessions were true, and he was one of the worst serial killers in U.S. history. But even though the bodies were not winding up where he said they were, leaving as many questions as answers, the Texas Drifter was still put on trial and given the death penalty in 1993. In 1999, the Los Angeles Times reported that Evans was on death row at Mississippi State Penitentiary when, while being escorted back to his cell from the showers, he was stabbed and killed by another inmate. In 1963, the Canadian news magazine McLean's did a deep dive into the life of Leopold Dion. They found that, surprisingly, there was something more tragic than the story of a serial killer taking the lives of children. It was the story of a serial killer who had already been tried and convicted of similar crimes, but was paroled multiple times before going on to kill. Dion's first conviction was in 1940, and he served 16 years before being released on parole. He hadn't finished the terms of that parole when he found himself back behind bars. But when he was released again, he would go on to abduct two boys at a time on two separate occasions, strangling them in remote locations. He can't keep getting away with it! Dion had made plans to kill three others, but found himself imprisoned again, this time charged with four murders that might have resulted in a death sentence. According to the Windsor Star, he was still being held in the Archambault Federal Prison in late 1972 when he was killed by fellow inmate Norman Champagne. Champagne, who was convinced that he was the reincarnated Lawrence of Arabia, was acquitted after entering an insanity defense. Some stories dance along the line between historical fact and fiction, and it's entirely possible that that's the case with Henri Catamarti. According to Vice, Marti was one of the countless people who moved to Barcelona at the turn of the 20th century. While hoping for a better life, she found little more than sickness, poverty, and misery. Instead of just making ends meet however she could, it's claimed that she started killing, mostly children, in order to drain their blood to sell in self-made tonics and medicines. Law enforcement finally caught up with her in 1912, and not long after she was arrested, she died in prison. The official reports say that she succumbed to uterine cancer, but other sources say she died at the hands of her cellmates, who were likely paid off by wealthy men and women who didn't want their names mentioned in the trial. Or was she? In preparation for a film about her life and death, substantial research was discovered that suggested she wasn't actually a serial killer, but a woman just trying to make her way in the world selling bloodless potions and cure-alls. The director of the Barcelona Vampirist argues that she was a scapegoat caught in a power struggle between the police and the media. In 1968, in Gaffney, South Carolina, four women were killed over 10 days by the so-called Gaffney Strangler. According to the Spartanburg Herald Journal, things kicked off when the editor of a local paper received an anonymous call from the killer on February 8th, directing law enforcement to the remains of two missing girls. Good luck. The community was on high alert, and eight days after, two vigilant locals recalled seeing Leroy Martin near the location where another body was discovered. He was arrested. Martin was found guilty and given four life terms, but he only spent a few years behind bars. He was killed in 1972, dying almost instantly when stabbed multiple times by fellow inmate Kenneth Marshall Rumsey. Rumsey was charged and convicted of Martin's murder, but only served five more years in prison before dying by suicide. The victims of the so-called I-5 Strangler were killed in Northern California between 1977 and 1987. The victims all showed signs of sexual assault, were strangled, and their clothes were sliced to ribbons. According to the Los Angeles Times, Roger Kibbe was on an early shortlist of suspects, but by the time he was finally arrested after trying to abduct another woman, seven people were dead. His original 1987 trial was only able to definitively link him to a single murder, and it wasn't until 2000 that DNA evidence had advanced to the point where law enforcement could tie him to more. Kibbe dodged the death penalty by promising to reveal the location of his final victim, who wasn't discovered and laid to rest until 11 years later. Kibbe sat in jail for another decade before he was killed at the age of 81 by his cellmate Jason Boudreau in 2021. Boudreau's confession was sent to the Mercury News. He explained in a five-page letter that he had planned on killing Kibbe from the very first day they started sharing the cell. Boudreau believed he had done it for noble reasons, and while calling himself a devotee of the dark arts, claimed that by killing Kibby, he was freeing the souls of his victims. As far as serial killers go, Charles Schmid was the whole package. A pathological liar with a Napoleon complex, history claims Schmid started killing teenage girls simply because he wanted to. And thanks to help from his friends, Mary French and John Saunders, he got away with his first murder, that of 15-year-old Aline Rowe. Then he just kept on killing. The next to die were a pair of sisters, and due in part to his tendency to brag, Schmid recruited help from another friend to bury them. And it was finally this friend who would turn him in. In exchange for reduced sentencing, Mary French and John Saunders 
agree to testify against Charlie Schmidt. According to the lifestyle and culture magazine Mel, Schmidt became known as the Pied Piper of Tucson for his popularity among the area's teens. After nearly a decade behind bars, on March 20, 1975, he was stabbed repeatedly by two other inmates who reportedly thought he was a prison snitch. Schmidt initially survived the encounter, now missing an eye and suffering from punctured intestines and lungs, but he would die 10 days later. University of Arizona English professor Richard Shelton was at his side, who Schmidt had reached out to in hopes of getting his poetry critique. Shelton later recalled, It was pretty grisly because they kept coming in and asking if they could remove certain things, like an eye or a kidney and they let him go, piece by piece. Jose Antonio Rodriguez Vega was finally brought to justice in 1991 when he was found guilty of the rape and murder of 16 elderly women in the Spanish city of Santander. According to the Associated Press, Vega's reign of terror spanned 10 months, often going to the homes of his targets while pretending to be a salesman or a repairman and simply strolling through the front door. Details on his crimes are scarce, but he only served a decade of his 440-year jail sentence. In 2002, Vega was transferred to a prison in Salamanca, where two inmates attacked and killed him. According to witnesses, Vega's killers told nearby prison guards that it was none of their business, and that they were simply handing out prison-style justice to a convict whose crimes warranted an unofficial death sentence. When it comes time to list the world's most infamous serial killers, Jeffrey Dahmer is definitely up at the top of the list. Dahmer's fame comes in part because of the shocking things found in his apartment when police intervened as his would-be victim Tracy Edwards fled Dahmer's apartment. We want a very gruesome discovery in Milwaukee overnight. Milwaukee police find a horrifying scene inside an apartment building. Their investigation turned up a 57-gallon drum filled with body parts and a fridge of human heads. By the time the dust settled around his 1991 capture, Dahmer admitted to killing 17 people starting in 1978. He was convicted and given 15 life sentences, but he would only last a few years in prison. Dahmer was killed by fellow inmate Christopher Scarver, who later said exactly why he did it. It seemed that Dahmer had enjoyed his reputation as a cannibal and would fashion his prison food into body parts and then joke about how he liked to bite. Scarver had confronted Dahmer with a newspaper clipping about his crimes, asking him if he was really guilty. When Dahmer confirmed that he was guilty, Scarver killed him with two blows from a weight room bar. Dahmer's last words, according to Scarver, were, I don't care if I live or die, go ahead and kill me. 